So we're uh, pleased to have uh, joined the podcast in just a few minutes, uh, Pat Ahern, who is a former Major League Baseball pitcher. And uh, we are going to be excited to talk to him about uh, what he's doing now, what his career was like. Uh, and it's kind of an interesting one, uh, sort of a guy who uh, just got a taste of the major leagues. And he's going to share that with us. Right. But he, he's played in other places, too. So there's a lot of interesting stuff we got to talk to about with Pat today. And we're looking forward to talking with him. So we're happy to uh, have a Pat Ahern uh, join the podcast. Uh, Pat pitched in the major leagues. In fact, he is the second major leaguer that we have had on our podcast. Uh, the first was Willie Blair. Um, and I checked and Willie Blair played at the same time that you did, although I think he was in San Diego then. And so you probably didn't see him, at least at the major league level that season. Welcome, Pat. We're so glad to have you. Uh, thanks, man. This is, I'm very excited to be on. And uh, I'm I... I almost qualify for being almost Cooperstown, but uh, yeah, no, not really. You are still far closer than any of us and likely almost all of our listeners as there are I, very I, few people. You made I, it there, I, which is more than any of us can say. I've, I've visited the place a couple of times. It's a really cool museum to be sure, I, yeah. And 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 I, I was looking before that only, I think it's something like 10 to 11% of minor leaguers make it to the major leagues. And I don't think people really think about that number that much. So just getting to, and I don't even know if they call it the show anymore, that comes from Bull Durham. I don't even know if that's still what they what they say. But to people that you know understand a little bit about baseball and like like we like we think we do, uh, just playing in the major leagues. And and I think maybe you could talk about what it took to get there and what your, what your path was uh, and how hard it is to be a major leaguer and, and what happened to you. Well, all right. So um, I guess the easiest place to start to keep it somewhat brief is uh, I, I played college ball at Pepperdine and uh, we were in my senior year, we were national champions. And so I think a guy like me who didn't necessarily light up the radar gun uh, would uh, need to have a lot of success, apparently. And I think I just got in under the wire where they would take a guy that throws like 85 to 90 with a sinker. So um, based off of, I think mostly that had a lot of success in college baseball. And then on the big stage in Omaha, um, I got picked up in the seventh round by the Tigers. And then um, I think, so essentially they sent me to high A, they sent me to Lakeland to start off. And uh, I had I had pitched so much in college. They basically asked me, say, they said, how much did you pitch in the last calendar year? And so I, you know, took out the abacus and it turned out I was close to 280 innings over the past calendar year between last, you know, the spring season, playing summer ball in Alaska and then the full season going all, all the whole distance. So anyways, they sent me home to rest for the 92 season, which was only a few months. And then I, I played my first full season in Lakeland in 93. And, um, you know, I, I started, I started fortunately in high a, a lot of guys had to go through rookie ball and all that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, it was, it was, uh, a little bit different playing, you know, from college world series, Omaha to, you know, uh, the, the crowds that you get in the middle of the summer in Lakeland, Florida, but, um, <laughs> You know, I started there and then I went uh, my second year. They put me into double A. Um, I bounced back and forth from starting rotation into bullpen and just got a taste of because I had really done a lot of relief pitching up till that point. And then um, I went to I went to camp in, as camp was approaching in 95. That was when the 94 strike was going on. And so uh, what they did was they invited all the minor league guys in early. So I actually showed up to camp in 95 at the same time that they would have invited all the major league pitchers. And uh, for the Tigers, uh, fortunately, they didn't have, I, I heard from other organizations, there was a little pressure campaign to get some of the minor league guys to, to cross and go as replacement players. But the Tigers just basically left a, a, a questionnaire in our locker that was asking like, would you be willing to play in spring training games as a replacement player or go all the, all the way as that. And, you know, I'm like 24 years old and just starting my career. And I 
had some bit of confidence that I might have a shot to pitch in the big leagues. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to, you know, have that stamp on me. Plus I didn't, it, it sounds funny, but you know, in a time like this or years from now, if anybody asked me, I'd never want to say, Oh yeah, I, I went over and took the money as a replacement player, but that was just everybody's personal decision. And I, I got no problem with, with whatever guys chose. That was just where I was at that time. So I think it might've helped me a little bit just to have some extra time being in camp and, and pitching. And so I had a, I had a pretty decent spring and I was already kind of, I think slated to be in the starting rotation in AAA in Toledo for that year. So I, um, I made it to that, that point. And then I started the season and just pitched great. I mean, I was going really well and uh, it got to a point probably towards the end of May where my agent would call me and say, Hey, listen, man, I don't know what's going on with these people. I'm about to call, uh, Joe Klein was the GM of the Tigers at the time. He's like, I'm going to call Joe Klein and say, what are you guys doing? It's not like they're, you know, they, they were actually okay mid season. So, you know, I think some of the, the noise that my agent made and then me having, you know, a decent record and a low ERA, they, uh, they ended up giving me a shot. So I, I got called up in the middle of the season and, uh, and um, you know, debuted at, at, at Old Tiger Stadium against the Yankees. So um, that's that's <laughs> kind of the, the storyline. And going back to your original question of, you know, kind of what does it take or what, what do you want to do? And, you know, aside from just performing on the field, I think one of the things mentally is that I was just so sort of, one track mind locked in determined what have you and and it was like nothing's going to derail me from this effort to to get to the major leagues and then funny enough after so i got called up was there for about two and a half weeks and then i got sent back to triple a and then just bombed after that to give you an idea, when I got called up, I was seven and one with an ERA of two something, and That's I finished point. the season in in Toledo. And then I got I, I got sent back down and finished the season in Toledo, and I was seven and nine with a four or something. So <laughs> it was it was a rough got, back half of the year. I, from, but, I mean, I can't but... from middle of June to the end of the season, I was zero and nine with probably like a six or something like that. It seemed like somebody else, and you you were. Uh, obviously modest because you were not just on the 1992 Pepperdine waves that won the national championship. You were the star pitcher and the dominant pitcher on that team. And that probably, I think might've been responsible for the looks that you got and, and the, the cred that you got from having such a dynamic uh, performance. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'd, I'd like to think so. I mean, aside from just the, the fun and enjoyment and excitement of winning the college world series, it was uh it was uh, help help my career, let's say. Um, and that remind because we're we're gonna go off some tangents, I'm sure. But it reminded me of uh, um, shortly after the uh, the games and stuff. You know, everybody had it on video, so I got to watch the broadcast. And so it was uh, Jim Cott and Greg Gumble were calling the game, and this was at a time when not every pitch was shown the velocity on the screen and they actually had a guy with a jugs gun behind the plate and they had a mm -hmm. cameraman so they had this little split screen in the corner of the back of the radar gun so here's jim cott he, he comes on he's like well aaron's doing really good today against wichita and let's see what his uh his velocity is and so i throw i throw the next pitch the guy swings right through it it was just a sinker he swung over the top of it and the radar gun said like 82. And so Jim Cott, Jim Cott says, well, you're not going to get a ticket in a school zone going that fast, but Ahern's been pretty effective today. <laughs> and I heard that. And, and my first reaction was, damn you, Jim Cott. That's a good one, though. <laughs> good All show. Favorite Jim Cott. All and, the favorite Jim Cott. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and actually, I got to... Uh, I, I, there was a uh, a book signing that he did in this uh, this place in in Midtown. I think it's Midtown somewhere in in, the, in New York. And uh, so I went over and I'm like, oh, cool. And and 
he did like a Q&A afterwards. And, and coincidentally, because my major league debut was against the Yankees, he was also broadcasting for the Yankees during that game. So I'm standing there and I'm just, hey, I got a question. Well, it's more of a thing like, you know, hey, you've, you've broadcasted two of the biggest games I've ever played in. And he looked at me and he's just like, hey, Pat, I, you know, he remembered. Oh, so it was really yeah. cool. Wow. Yeah, it was really cool. So got got to chat with Jim Cott some more and, uh, you know, it's, uh, and talk about almost Cooperstown, that fella, man, he's, he's got the numbers. And I, I think he just like, he, he, you know, he finally kept made it playing. In. <laughs> oh did he okay yeah See, he finally that's, made how, it that's how caught up I'm, i am on this so congratulations Jim. <laughs> yeah, i'm yeah. really happy for the guy that's great <laughs> yeah yeah we are we are too we think uh, he, he's very very deserving and so you you had you had four appearances you had three starts uh i guess in a relief appearance for the tigers um and and we're going to get to this later on because you know in, in in parlance of major leagues that's for you that's not a cup of coffee that's more like a cup of tea i would say in the <laughs> possibly you know i I always described it as as they uh, they they brought me my cup of coffee. I asked them if they had any sugar, and they just took my coffee away from me. So, it's uh, it's close, yeah. But I get you know a, a cup of tea might work a little better. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, you had teammates uh, on that team, um, and I maybe would talk a little bit about. I, I picked out C.J. Nitkowski and Alan Hall of Famer Alan, Alan Trammell should be Hall of Famer Lou Whitaker, Whitaker if you ask us. Uh, mm -hmm. Cecil Fielder and uh, 30 year, 38 year old Kirk Gibson. Um, and obviously you weren't there for a long time, but, but did you have camp with any of those guys or they just come in right at the end when the strike was settled and you didn't get that much time? Talk about that a little. Um, no, I didn't, I didn't get the chance to interact with a lot of the big league guys um, because of how I, I forget exactly the details of how the strike uh, resolved itself, but um but yeah, most of those guys I met, um, you know, a couple a couple of the guys came up with me, like Bobby Higginson and and maybe, uh, well, like Chris Gomez was on that team, and he he I played against him in college because he went to Loyola Marymount out in California, and um, a lot of these other guys though, you know, you'd see them in camp, you know, I I think the year before I remember um, going going in the gym in Lakeland and. Um, our uh, the the team's strength and strength and conditioning guy, a guy named Brad Andrus, who's a beast, and he and Kirk Gibson were in the gym, just the two of them working out. And I think I came in to do some stretch or whatever I was doing, but they were just like crazily intense. Like Brad, he's doing pull ups, and Brad's like in his face going, "Come on, get it up, get it!" And like he finished his last rep, Kirk Gibson did, and just let out a noise that made alligators and Lake Parker flinch like oh my god what was that and they're you know good friends I'm sure but they were like cussing each other out just to motivate and that sort of thing and it and that's a, a small bit of the intensity but I, I have uh I have to uh uh ask you guys the policy at almost Cooperstown of language because I can tell you my favorite Kirk Gibson story if you might have to beat me out or <laughs> beep it out or something like that. We get a little but, uh, salty, but not too much. If you need to, you know, you, as long as it's in the in this case, that's fine. Yeah. And I think okay, in this so, case, the Kirk Gibson story is a hundred percent worth anything that we might probably. Oh, will never well, do okay. So, so I, I'll, I'll give you the whole series. So only, I was only there for a couple of weeks. So I only have a couple of Kirk Gibson stories. So I get called up in June and, um, the, the way that they did it was the last group of batting practice is when all the pitchers leave shagging and they go and do their running out in the outfield, right? So I'm three days in the big leagues and it's June in Detroit, so it's hot. So I get over there and I do my running. And at the end of it, I'm all sweaty and I'm like, I forget that I'm in the major leagues and I can say, hey, can I get another hat? And they'll just give you a box of hats. So I'm still I'm still in Toledo where they give you one hat for the whole season. So there's another five minutes of batting practice. And I took my hat and I tucked it in the back of my shirt. And then five minutes finished, I go in, I'm sitting there in front of my locker and uh, and and I hear Kirk Gibson behind me. Hey, rookie. Hey, rookie. 
Who the hell are you that you can't wear your goddamn hat during batting practice? And he looks across the room at Cecil Fielder, who we we call him Dad. It was his nickname. So he's like, hey, Dad, the rookie here can't wear his goddamn hat during batting practice. What do you think of that? And <laughs> Cecil Fielder just, Cecil Fielder sitting in front of the locker and he goes like this. Oh, no. <laughs> and that's all he said. And I turn around and he's like right over my shoulder. And of course, I'm, you know, I'm, I got to get a change of underwear after this. But I look at Kirk Gibson and I'm in full denial. No, Gibby, no, I had my hat on. I didn't take my hat off during brag practice. I'm, and he glares at me. He's like, all right, rookie, well, keep your goddamn hat on during batting practice. And then and then other times where, you know, like there were there were little things like when you're sitting on the bench, you you're if you're not pitching here, you, you better be in the game though, because I'd be sitting there watching. And the first time it happened, I just happened to know. I'm sitting watching the game and over on the other side of the bench, hey, rookie, what's the count? Says two and one, Gibby. Okay. You know, he's like, you know, sort of keeps everybody, you know, involved. And so it was, it was cool like that. And then each time that I would pass by the guy, hey, Gibby, how you doing? You just grunt at you like, eh, like that. That's, that's all you get. Or... He would he would be the type of player, and I thought this was really cool too. He would be the type of player that, if the pitcher made a good pitch and got him out, he was sort of upset. But if a pitcher made a pitch that you should have hit and he should have got him, and he kind of got himself out, don't go near the guy. It was like like for instance, there was one time where he grounds out, and we're in the third base dugout, old Tiger Stadium. He grounds out, and he comes back across the infield. And the camera's following him. And he spots the guy in the camera well following him. And he points at, he looks at the guy, points at the field, and goes, the fucking game's out there. You know, he's like <laughs> really mad that they got him, right? So, but I, I will say this though. I uh I pitched a, a couple games. My last game was in Boston. So I pitched the game. I came back the next day. I was doing my exercises, and then the worst words that a ball player wants to hear, other than you're going to need surgery was they need to see you in the office. Like Skip wants to see you in the office. So I get called in and Sparky Anderson was managed at the time. And he told me, you know, uh, I think it was like Scott Fletcher's coming off the DL. We need a space for him and we're going to have to send you back to Toledo. And so I just was like, okay, well, you know, that happens. And I'll, hopefully I'd work my way back to it. So shook hands with Sparky. I came out came out the clubhouse and the first guy to come up to me and slap me on the shoulder was Gibby. And he's like, Hey, rookie, man, keep working hard. Get yourself back up here. All right. And I'm like, yeah. That's, and of course, that's and me. of course, the, and of course the, then the last thing I got on, on him was that, you know, my, me being a lifelong Dodger fan and, and so, and I come back home to LA after the season, all my friends are like, did you just walk up to Gibby and just go like this? You know, because because that was like I, you know, one of those one of those things in life. Like I remember exactly where I was. You know what I was watching on TV at my granddad's house in L.A. and he was in the other room. Ball leaves the park, high fly ball to right field. She's gone, and I just was jumping up and down, ran and grabbed my granddad. You know, so it was it was one of those things. And so I always say, like, what was the best thing about being in the big leagues? I'm like, I was teammates with Kirk Gibson, and the dude. <laughs> The dude was the designated hitter in my first major league start. So Kirk Gibson was my DH. I'm like, oh, that's that's cool. He can he can be my DH. That, that's, like, a, that's a pretty good thing to be able to boast about. I I think yeah, it's kind of fun. What's super interesting is is that you know you said you went you know you didn't pitch well after that and you went back to the minor leagues, but you ended up playing for another 50, almost 15 years, I think, um, mm -hmm. after that on and off, uh, you know, moving around the world, doing different things? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it depends on what your your sort of <laughs> definition is, because like, for, for example, I played, uh, I played in an organization up until 2004. So signed in 92, played to 2004. And then 05 and 06, I played in the Atlantic League. And um, that counts. Oh, and 07, I played in Taiwan in the in the uh, CPBL, I think it is. And uh, so played in Ta Taiwan in 07. I actually went to I went to work with Tom House because he was opening up a, a training site in L.A. So 
he hired me on to go work with him and coach guys. And I thought that was going to be, you know, like, okay, here's where I'm going to spend the rest of my time. And, um, you know, it was right in 2008 and then the economy sort of tanked and that didn't bode well for the whole thing. And then I just happened to, uh, you know, back my way into opportunity to play overseas. And so, um, you know, I, you could, you could say that I, I play, I played in, uh, in Europe for, um, let's see, uh, probably 09, 2010, 2011, and then came over and started coaching for the Bluefish. So, I mean, I, I've been involved in it in one way or another for as my entire adult life, basically. So as, as Connecticut residents, um, Gordon and I have been to both uh, Bridgeport Bluefish games uh, mm -hmm. you know, over the years. That stadium is no longer a, a baseball stadium, sad to say. Uh, the team disbanded and they are trying to come up with another use for that facility. We remember when it was, well, I remember when it was built because they, Bridgeport didn't have anything like that. And then we also used to go out through Gordon's Little League to the New Haven mm -hmm. Ravens um, and rally the Raven, I think, was the mascot in New Haven. Uh, you played there for a show. Well, Todd Helton played there. Uh, and I think we might have got to see him play in 1996. So we kind of have, you know, we know what the East Coast baseball is, even the Long Island Ducks. I mean, I grew up on Long Island, you know, uh, that those were, uh, you know, all and, and those all count as hey, this is, you know, professional baseball. And you basically I, I, I think you played in Australia in as late as 2011. So um, you can talk about that a little bit as well, because uh, I, I can't imagine what it'd be like playing baseball in Australia. Well, uh, you know, the first the first thing that you realize is that uh, you go there in the winter here, but you're in the summer there. So you uh, you get to you get to do fun things like like uh, Christmas dinner is shorts and a T-shirt out in the backyard having a barbecue. And uh, you have to get up at around depending on where you are in the country, you got to get up around. 7 30 8 o'clock in the morning on mondays to see the super bowl so yeah it's super bowl monday in australia but um uh, uh other than that though i mean the the league is good and it's it's improved quite a bit since i played there i ended up playing in the middle of my career i played there in winter ball for three years i played one season in adelaide one season in melbourne and then uh the third one was in perth and um i i had uh I actually had one in my third season there. I was playing in Perth and there was an American guy who was coaching the national team. And he came up to me and he said, listen, there may be a way that we can get you dual citizenship and you can come pitch for us for the home team in the Sydney Olympics in 2000. And I was like, well, let me think about that for a second. Yes. You know, so I, I actually started that process because Apparently, there was some Hungarian weightlifters at some point that in a short span of time became Australian citizens, which was coincidentally right before some big Olympic competition. So they were trying to do something like that for, for me. Unfortunately, they closed the loophole right about that time. And so I wasn't able to become part Australian and play in the Olympics for them. But that would have been really cool. And then, and then of course, the, the league folded or it, it actually scaled back from the original league was like the Claxton Shield, which I think they played only, you know, in in a league in the city. And then the winners of those played. I forget how it was structured, but they then they they expanded out with the help of Major League Baseball to where you're playing in different cities and traveling and stuff like that. But then um, right around that time, around I guess it was around 99 or 2000, they had to scale it back so they went more local competition and then less foreigners were coming around and all that sort of thing so but then they since had had sort of amped it up and um and the time that i went back in uh, 2011 i was pitching in uh in czech republic and one of my teammates was um australian from adelaide and he played he plays in that league and and uh the uh he he said, you know, oh, Pat's pitching great. Let's bring him down and and he can help us out or whatever. And coincidentally, the manager for Adelaide, still the same manager that I played for when I first went down there in 1996. So wow. 
part of part of the recommendation was from my teammate and part that you know that Tony Harris who was managing knew knew who I was and and when I was with the Dodgers and then played down Adelaide so um so you end up going there and it's uh it's a it's a lighter schedule to be sure because a lot of those guys at the time would you know work for a living so it became a thing where you would play a game on Friday and a doubleheader Saturday or maybe a game Friday Saturday Sunday and those were all the series. So, you know, you'd, if you were on the road, you'd fly out Friday morning, play the game, stay overnight, play a doubleheader Saturday, and then go back home. So that was kind of how the schedule was. And then they'd give you Monday off, and then you'd practice Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So, hmm. What kind of crowds but, were, you, were you getting at those kinds of games? It varied. Um, it varied depending on the venue and maybe uh, – you know, I think I think at the at that time that baseball in Australia would go through cycles where it would get more popular and then less popular, and and so uh, you know when when I was there in in Adelaide, we we got probably I don't know maybe a thousand or so. But what was funny was one time I saw from two years prior that I got there, they showed a replay of like a championship match on TV. And there was like six thousand or so people in the stands. It was like, yeah, where are those guys? So it's big, right? Yeah, and I think now too, there's there's a lot more guys that are are you know making their way and get to the big leagues. So when you come back, you're like, oh, there's you know so and so that played you know major league baseball, and now he's he's at home playing in the in the ABL. So mm. I think that you know boosts the popularity of the of the sport there. So what is, you know, as somebody that played in both Europe and, and, and in, the, in China a little bit in Taiwan and in Australia, what is, you know, one of the things that I've noticed watching as the NBP and the uh, KBO have become more popular is the fan experience there seems so much different in terms of how they're part, almost participating in the game compared to America. Do you know, did you notice that as a player or as you're a player, it's kind of just playing baseball and what's ever going on in the stands, you don't really notice. Oh, no, no, you, you, you definitely notice. Um, the, uh, it, in, in Taiwan was sort of one of the first, well, when you go to Taiwan, there's, there's, uh, there's people that bring musical instruments there. And, you know, so they'll have a big, huge drum and they'll have guys with trumpets and somebody with a flag and everybody has those. They're like little, they look like little baseball bats. With the big, they're basically wiffle ball, but they're open top and they just sit there and bang them together the whole time. So when your team is batting, all of your fans who sit behind your dugout will be with their little their little noisemaker things going click 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 and then there's guys with the drums going boom 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 and then somebody playing the playing the uh the trumpet or something like that and then you got flag wavers when stuff happens and all that sort of thing and uh it's it's kind of a fun atmosphere actually and um there, there was one there was one team that we played for they had I think it was I think he was a Dominican guy but he had he had some pop right so he got known for hitting home runs and so whenever he would come to the plate instead of play, keeping the rhythm and doing everything there was a guy who had fashioned something that looked like a bazooka and he stood up with his bazooka and pointed it towards the left field fence and then everybody else took their little noise making things and instead of keeping a rhythm they all stood up and went full babe ruth and just pointed so it's all quiet when he's up, and the whole all of the fans are just pointing to the outfield like he's about to hit a home run. So calling his shot like Babe Ruth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're kind of cool. calling the guys on a field shot, and and of course, uh, all that meant when you're on the mound is like there's no way right this is happening. If I have to, if I have to put one on your knuckles and and then bounce one in the dirt, I don't care if I walk you. You're not, I'm not making these fans happy today. Heck no. So. <laughs> you um you made reference to Tom House and 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 I think that's a good transition because I know you're involved in coaching and you do some video reviews and I wonder if 
your uh, time with Tom House sort of inspired you because he is the still a pitching guru at whatever age he is, 81. And I remember Tom House, I'm pretty sure, was the guy who caught Henry Aaron's 715th home run in the bullpen um, in 1974. Uh, he but, was, and, actually. He was, yeah. You can see all that in the uh, in the video, for sure. And it, he, uh, well, I, I can start with that because he's told me the story because um, – what happens was when when he was getting when Hank Aaron was getting ready to break the record, and the way the old uh, I think it's Fulton County Stadium had the outfield set up is that you could just sort of roam around, and so all the all the veteran guys they got the prime spots like you know you have Hank Aaron's scouting report if he hits one out it's likely to go in this area, and so he's like and I'm a rookie so I got the this and it just worked out the way that way that the veteran guy sent me over here and the home run came to me. And he said, I caught the ball. And he goes, all I could think of was I want to give it to Hank. And so you'll see that there's like a scene at home plate and there's photos of it where he's just holding it up, like presenting it to him at home plate, which is, you know, it was, it was really cool. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so he, he told me that story. He told me, he's told me a lot of stories. It, it, one of my favorites was, uh, he was he was uh, coaching with the Rangers. He's pitching coach with the Rangers, and Nolan's in the bullpen getting ready to start. And the way Tom tells the story, he's like, "Yeah, he looked like he was kind of couldn't find it. He was struggling a little bit. And halfway through his warmups, he just threw the ball on the ground and went in the clubhouse, just disappeared. And so he's like shrugging his shoulders. He walks in and tells the manager, I think I think it was Bobby Valentine at the time. He's like, "Hey, Skip, I." I don't know if we have a starting pitcher. I don't know what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And a couple minutes before the game starts, Nolan comes out and just takes the mound and proceeds to strike out the side on nine pitches. And he comes in the dugout and Tom's telling the story. He goes, and Nolan, you know, he's, he's a man of few words. So when Nolan speaks up, the whole dugout tends to like, okay, what's, what's Nolan got to say? So he strikes out the side on nine pitches. He comes in the dugout and he says, boys, just get me one today. Oh. And that was his seventh no-hitter. Oh, that's outstanding. So, that's yeah, just... it, was, it was really cool. Really cool. The uh, documentary that his family put together called Facing Nolan um, is actually really good. I don't know if you've had a chance. It's on Netflix. So, no, I haven't really, seen that. Really I got to check good. it out. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a bit of a love letter from the family, but that's cool. You know, it, yeah. Yeah. So, so did did Tom House, um, you know, because of what he was doing, did that inspire you to sort of get into pitch coach, pitching coaching, and things like like that? Well, uh, so my my history at Tom House, my agent was uh, the brother of Pete O'Brien, who used to play for the Rangers, and so he knew Tom, and I had been because I I'm you know pitching nerd, and I was reading everything I get my hands on, so of course I had all of Tom House's books and read them through a bunch of times. And so my agent was like, I want to see if I can get you to work with Tom House. And he was in San Diego. So I would drive a couple hours down from LA. I was living in LA at the time and uh, and just go there and do bullpens and stuff with him. And one of the really amazing things about Tom House is that I would, I would go there in the off season and I'd say to him like, okay, this is what I was sort of struggling with during the season and let me show you and he would just watch a couple of pitches and be able to say to you okay try this and then all of a sudden poof, poof, it's right there and it was it was amazing so I did that and that was after my first season so I played in Lakeland in 93 and then in the off season 93 I met Tom House and then every year from that I would just go and and go down to San Diego and train with him in the off season and um uh, when, one of the things that I thought was really cool was was uh, there would be things that I would sort of figure out mechanically, and then I would come and see Tom House, and I'd say, hey, I was doing this during the season, and I got really good feel for it and good results. And he, and he would say, as a matter of fact, the motion analysis sort of confirms what you're talking about. I'm like, yeah, sweet. You know, so I would I – would, figure something out pitching out in the world and then come back to Tom and say, Oh yeah, we, we had all these guys on the motion analysis and it shows exactly what you're talking about. So it was, it was pretty fun like that. And so um, it, it 
the relationship continued and he's like one of my favorite people in the whole world. He's just the greatest guy. And um, so towards, I was playing in uh, Long Island for the Ducks in 2006 and I came back from the season and he said, I'm going to start up this facility at, on campus at USC and we're going to train pitchers and I'd like you to come work for me. And I was like, okay, when's that going to happen? He goes, well, we're working on it. So go ahead and start the season. And if we can, you know, get you paid well enough to earn a living, you can decide whether or not you want to just leave during the season and come work for me. Because at that time it was like, I was, I don't know, 36 or something. So you're thinking I'm in the independent ball throwing, you know, 85 mile an hour sinkers at age 36 and here's an opportunity. So I, I was, I was like, of course, yeah, just say the word and I'll be there. So, um, but I, then I went out and played, I started out in, in, uh, with the ducks and then I got picked up and played this rest of the season in Taiwan. And when I came back from Taiwan, that was when I started working with Tom and it was the same time that, uh, Rinku and Dinesh, the the two Indian kids that were in the movie Million Dollar Arm, those guys mm -hmm. showed up. And so I got to meet them, you know, three days after they arrived in the U.S. and, um, you know, coach those guys and get to hang out with them and stuff. And so, you know, now, now, now Rinku is a pro wrestler, which is pretty funny because he was, you yeah. know, 18 years old and weighed about a buck 50 when I met him. And now he's this hulking monster of a professional wrestler. You told mm -hmm. me, uh, and maybe we'll say this for another time. You told me a great story about Barry Bonds uh, and, and dinner in, in, uh, in LA uh, out by USC. Of course, you, I think I mentioned I went to USC. So every time you talk about, you know, that kind of stuff, I was there before all that. Um, uh, but yeah, that, that's, a, that's a heck of a story as well. Um, and and maybe, well, maybe just tell it now because I think it's pretty quick. All right, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta be careful because uh, there was, there's no love between the waves and the Trojans when we we're on the baseball <laughs> field. So I can say that, and uh, and it was weird because when I came to work for Tom House, I'm on campus over at Dado Field there at, at SC, and I had to wear like USC baseball stuff, and I'm like, oh, oh that that was good off of me, <laughs> get this off of me. So, oh, so anyways, um, the guy who was Rinku and Dinesh's agent, who was played mm -hmm. by John Hamm in the movie, uh, JB, he also worked with Barry Bonds. And then somehow, I didn't, I don't know how it happened exactly, but introduced the Indian kids to uh, Barry Bonds. And so mm -hmm. towards the end of the time that they were, you know, close to maybe getting signed or whatever, and they had everybody over to this house that they were staying, which was right off campus at, near USC. And, uh, you know, Barry Bonds is there. I'm like, oh, holy crap, you know, and get, got to meet him and shake his hand. He's a cool guy. And and uh, Rinku and Dinesh had sponsorships from uh, Indian Food Company. So in their pantry, they had all of the just stacks and stacks of all these different Indian dishes <laughs> that they would just take them out of the package, boil them, and then put them out. So they prepared the whole meal for us. So we get there and there's like, five or six catering dishes with all these different uh, Indian dishes in there. And, you know, whatever was on TV and everybody's chatting in the other room and here's Barry Bonds. And so, of course, Rinku and Dinesh didn't make, didn't make Barry get up in the line and serve himself. So they prepared a plate for him. And I remember they just walked out and they're like, it, everybody was sir to them too. It's like, Barry Bonds, sir, here's your, uh, your dinner. And he took it, he looked at him and he, he looked at the dish. He looked at Rinku and Dinesh and said, you guys trying to kill me or what? <laughs> and I guess he ate it, so he, and he, he's still alive. So he's still yeah. around, right? Maybe, maybe around. not a big fan of the Indian cuisine, or or he is now. Who knows? He might have been introduced to something he loves that day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was all right. Um, it so wasn't bad either. I'll say that. You, you obviously you've been you have your video thing, uh, the way of baseball, where you're are uh reviewing tapes and or tapes of you know video files to help uh, pitchers you're still doing that today correct yes so uh it, it started out as something to sort of augment the uh income of of minor league baseball plus um having the ability it actually started more when i was pitching coach with the bluefish and so i thought mm -hmm. well 
you know, I have I have a little credibility in this area and the technology is such. So basically what happens is that players can go on the website, sign up for the program, and then they download an app that I use for coaching and connect via the app to me. So then, you know, a lot a lot of the players are, you know, little leaguers, maybe some high school guys in, in, in that range. And so what will happen is they'll, their dad or their teammate or whatever will use the app and record video of them making a pitch or throwing a bullpen. And then it appears on my phone that I have a, a video to review. And then I'm able to look at it and do a voiceover and tell us straight some lines and give them some, some oh, things wow, to work really on. Cool. It, you know, it was funny. I, I, it turned out to be a really good thing because I wasn't sure how effective remote coaching in that sense would be, but the guys that I've been working with are, are, they're happy with it and they're getting results. And, and you can see, especially because what it does is it, it puts everything in a feed. So you can actually scroll back, like almost like a Facebook page, you can scroll back to see what the original one looked like. So oftentimes I'll work with a guy for a couple months and do some, some tweaks and adjusts here and there. And, um, and then they'll send me a video. And I, what I like to do oftentimes is take the video they sent me yesterday and compare it to the one from a couple months ago so that I'm able to say, look at what we've done up to this point. And, and, Hopefully they're impressed with it. I'm, I am myself because these guys, you know, they they take the stuff, they implement it, and and you know whether it's them or their dad or whatever, they always are like, man, I, this is this is really helping. So, um, cool. and and uh, it's it's an enjoyable way to actually reach more players because I, I remember thinking when I was coaching the bluefish, you have, you know, maybe a dozen pitchers at a time that you're dealing with on a daily basis. But if there's a way to have, you know, 50, a hundred, 200 guys that you're able to, to it help, is. it's like, yeah. yeah. And so, and so the, the why of it sort of became like putting out good information for pitchers and trying to develop the game in, in any way possible. And, and just, uh, and, and, and so that became uh, a little side project, which, you know, it, it becomes seasonal. So in the springtime, when Little League starting to gear up and high school is getting ready and all that sort of thing, then, you know, you get a little more people with showing some interest in that. But I think also it's it's more effective because I've had a few guys that have sort of stayed with it through the off season, And then you get into a little bit more. Uh, a little bit more personalized stuff. So oftentimes what will happen is I'll get a player, they'll send me a video and usually there's a couple, three different things that you can do to make adjustments that will cause their, their game to go from here to here. And so there's a big jump right off, right off the bat. And then after that, it becomes these little incremental adjustments, which funny enough, you go from here to here at first, and then it's just as big of a move to go from here to here. Mm -hmm. So when you get all of the, the, the major things down, then you start to personalize little things that maybe as individuals, they're going to, they're going to have their struggles with. So one pitcher may have an issue with this and he's always, you know, sort of fighting that and trying to make an adjustment and keep that straight whereas that's not a problem for another pitcher. And then once you get that sort of baseline of solid mechanics and efficiency and understanding what you're trying to do as a pitcher, then, then you can start to say, okay, well, let's you know, develop a second pitch or a third pitch, or let's work on the idea of you know, whenever you miss, you miss you know, high and in to a righty, let's say. And so there's a, you know, there's a, a, a definite um idea of of if you're missing at a certain location consistently you're doing something there's something going on in the mechanics that if you make the adjustment all of a sudden no more it's not a problem so those are the kind lose, of personalized things we get into yeah if you're if you're losing every fastball in on the righties then that means that there's something going on in the mechanics if you're always missing in the same fashion the same way if you're always losing balls 
out to the left hand side, like into left hand batter's box as a right handed pitcher, you're probably, you know, collapsing too early and, and falling over yourself when you're pitching. But like, I, I think it's just so interesting because when I was playing, we didn't really like, I think the, the that thing I think is the, the coolest part about that because that's something that like every kid could have access to. And yeah, sure, you, you it's, it's a paid service, but being able to just look back at your own footage of what you're doing is one it's it's incredibly hard thing to think watch yourself pitch but in terms of improving quickly it's probably one of the best things you can do for yourself oh heck yeah i mean and i think that's like shoot in all in almost anything you know you you hear people who and i i never did it but if if people like kept a journal for instance and they were able to go back and see what they were thinking and feeling years ago and how how far they've come or, or that sort of thing. It's, it, it works with just about anything you can think of where, you know, you don't necessarily see little incremental improvements, but if you look at it over a bigger span of time, you think, Oh man, look at where I was and look at where I am now. So, and, and it's funny because some of these guys, and I mean, I, I have enough because I, I, um, when I, when I was playing, I wasn't one of these guys who was, always hanging around the pitchers and just down the bullpen or whatever. It's like, I was a dude who was like quietly hanging out behind the batting cage. And I'd Mm -hmm. watch all the hitters, what they're doing, what they're thinking about all, all this stuff. And so that's how I started into it. And then when I got into coaching, say for the high school team, or I was coaching, uh, I was, I was managed in the team in, in Hong Kong and I wanted to be able to bring them some, some, uh, things that they could do at the plate as well. And it's, it's so like, uh, it's almost like you're looking in a mirror because we were talking about between, between pitchers and hitters, because, you know, we were just talking about how if you're consistently missing a pitch this way, there's something mechanically that you're doing that's causing that, or maybe your conditioning is such that when you get fatigued, it starts going that way. And on the flip side of it, if you're a hitter and you're always getting beat by a certain pitch or you're only hitting a balls to this part of the field and you want to use the whole field, for instance, not, not that they do that anymore, but (laughs) if you did, then, you know, then there's mechanical things that you need to address. If this pitch is always beating you or that pitch, you, you can't, you know, put it in play where you want to put it in play. So, um, so I, I, I started really, being even more of a study of the hitters so that when I went to the high school, I could teach the hitting to the high school kids and, and the guys over in Hong Kong as well. So what ended up happening was I get, I got several players who came to me for pitching and then their dad was like, Hey, can you help him out with his swing too? And so, (laughs) so, uh, you know, I I just kind of, I don't, I don't necessarily advertise it because most of the time you hear that and you say, well, Oh, you, you, you pitched your whole time. What do you know about hitting? And I'm like, well, I know how to get him out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I know how to get him out. It's that, or, it's that, or you don't pitch anymore. How's that sound? <laughs> um, I, I, I want to make sure that we ask you about your tea business, because that's how you and I actually first became con- connected. But before that, I, you know, we talked about, you know, pitching uh, just now. And I, I noticed today that uh, 25 major league pitchers last year pitched 180 innings or, um, or less. Uh, or more, I should say. So only 25. And so obviously we know workloads are up. And I wonder what you would think about why so many pitchers can't go deeper into games, why starting pitchers can't pitch 200 innings even to, to any degree. I think Gary Cole might have been the only guy to do it in, in, in 2023. Um, and, and so what's happening out there from your vantage point as a former major leaguer and pitching coach? Well, so looking at how things have progressed and, and of course I, you know, coached in the Atlantic league in 2005 and 2000, no, sorry, 2014, 2015. So I was coaching professionally at at that level and, you know, paying attention to all this stuff. So the, the theories that I have, and these are only sort of anecdotal, just watching this and being around the game is that, uh, there's, there's definitely a lot of uh, analytics that have taken over, which um, it's sort of, it, it's, it's quite useful. I'm not sure that it could be, it could be the only tool that you have in your arsenal in, in terms of deciding, 
you know, who pitches when and how much, but it definitely, uh, you know, can take the heat off of some of the decision makers who can say, well, why did you take him out then? Well, the analytics said that this was a good move at the time. So it, it sort of absolves them of saying, you know, why did you take him out? Well, my gut was that this guy was going to be able to get this guy out and I was wrong. And so then that's, that's how dudes get fired anyway. So, <laughs> but, but when you have that in your back pocket as a tool, it's useful. If it's the only thing that drives your decision, it could be problematic, but also, I think that you have a lot more guys who who uh, are are good relief pitchers. So there's a, a comfort level as a manager of saying, "Well, I got some arms in the bullpen, and I got cards to play. So if I have a really good matchup coming up in in the fifth inning, and that may be the moment of the game that where the right. game's won or lost." And so if you say, okay, I got a guy who's started the game and he's at like, say, 85 pitches and the lefty who already hit a double off him is coming up, I'm going to have my my good matchup lefty ready to go. And if we get to that guy, I'm just going to go with the odds and the good matchup and all that sort of thing in an attempt because, because really you never really know when – the moment the game is decided, it could be in the second inning. It could be in the ninth inning. That's a great point. So, yeah. so there, there's also, you know, some, some listening to your baseball instincts that say, you know what, this may be the moment of the game that if I left my starter in and he gives up a hit and a couple of runs, that might be all she wrote. But if I play this card and stop it here, then sort of, you know, cobble it together for the rest of the game or what, what have you. So I think that affects it a little bit too. Um, I think that's, that's that, such a, that's such a good point because we we've accepted that with closers now that the, the prevailing logic is, Hey, their closer is generally the best reliever you have in your bullpen. You're going to use him in the highest leverage situation and not necessarily just strictly pitch him. Oh, he's the only goes in the ninth inning. He's the ninth inning guy. So if that logic extends to the closer, why wouldn't extend to the whole game? If you have a position in the fourth inning where your starter isn't the best guy to go anymore, why wouldn't you put in somebody else if that's what's going to give you the best chance to win? I think that's just such a great point. Yeah, they. I mean, there, there's there's definitely some some shift in strategy over time. You know, from when. Uh, when it, when it was like, I don't know, I, I, I played, I played a season, a couple of seasons in Venezuela and Phil Regan, the old Dodger relief pitcher was the manager. And, you know, you look up his stats and he's a relief pitcher and he had something like a hundred some innings, like he pitched a lot. So, you know, there's, there's used to be that mentality of just run the guy out there, let him go as much as he can. If he starts to get tired, we get him out of there. And so you get a lot more, guys that go perfect or full games and get complete games and do all that stuff. And then it started to, to fade out as, as it continued. But um, one of the, one of the interesting things going sort of along this line of, of thought here is that all of the closers that I've seen and that I've known, there's a, there's definitely good stuff. But it's just you have to have a closer's mentality because it's a different animal to come in and you're you're the last guy before they, you know, if if they're going to you're the last guy before you get overrun. So if you if you, if it stops with you, that's it. There's nobody else behind you. So there's a there's a mentality to that. And then there's also a mentality of like, let's say you're uh a dude like a Mariano Rivera or a Kenley Jansen, who's known for that just nasty cutter. Well, if you go out there and the first batter you face, it ain't cutting, then what do you do? You know, so they, you have to have that mentality of like, okay, I'm going to come out here and, you know, shove 25 cutters down your throat. And if you, if you go away with firewood that even the better, but <laughs> if, if you're if you go out there and you're like, uh oh, then you got to have that mentality of just either either I'm confident enough that it's going to come back on the next pitch or 
you may have some sort of secondary thing that you can go to. And if you go out there as a closer and you have to go to your second best and you get beat, that's that's a challenge too. And you got to have have a mindset to do that. And then you got to have a mindset to say, okay, well, good game today. Get ready for tomorrow because you're going to do the same thing tomorrow. Right. Whereas for my part, it was like, like game day for me was huge. And then I had four days to just chill and dug out and be a fan and give everybody high fives and, you know, see if I could pick up, pick the opposing pitchers pitches or something like that. So, uh, so there's, there's definitely mentality that goes along with being a closer, which is even different from just the general relief guy. Right. But, um, you know, there's, there's stuff like that. And then also, um, you know, and this is this is one of the things that I learned from Tom House is that a pitcher's effectiveness and their health is mostly based on three different factors. One, it, it, genetics aside, the three different variables that you can actually control is their amount of functional strength, their mechanics, and their workload. So when you see pitchers who only go a certain amount in a game, or if you see pitchers who are good for pitching like one inning or maybe two innings or whatever, then you start to notice what those variables are. So if you say, okay, here's a guy who's functionally strong, but his mechanics are terrible. So if you've turned him into a starting pitcher and said, go throw 250 innings in a season, he'd be strong enough to go be strong early in the season, but he'd start to tail off because his mechanics are what's failing him. And that takes away from some of your functional strength. On the other side of it, if you got really good mechanics, but you're not functionally strong, then you could see how that would play into it. And so when you put a, somebody together who has great functional strength and great mechanics, then you can say to him, hey, go out and give me 120 pitches every five days. Hey, go out and do that for a season or a career. Right. And they can, you know, just knock on wood, avoid any serious injury or wear and tear because the the workload, they're able to handle the workload better. So when you see stuff like that, and then you start to see, okay, this relief pitcher has some funky mechanics but he gets it done and gets you know gets lefties out or gets righties out or what have you but their mechanics are weird it's like okay well you know that that guy couldn't give you five or six innings every five days because his arm would fall off but he can give you <laughs> one batter or one inning or two innings maybe and then you know take a few Sorry. days or a day off or whatever so so when you look at pitchers you can if you kind of keep that in mind then you can say okay well you know these guys that have really good mechanics, they can go deep in the game. Guys that don't, you know, they may be better suited to come out of the bullpen and pitch an inning or get a couple hitters out or, be, you know. Yeah. I think I think that might also go out the window a little bit with the closer because the mm. closer has to be able to do it daily, theoretically, but. Right, yeah, or at least back to back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and 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 as you talked a lot about the mental part of the game. I think as I kept listening to you talk here and kind of weaving in it about how much your preparation and your mental makeup. And and you mentioned to me when when we talked before um, about how you got um, developed a love for tea when you were playing overseas and how the tea actually you felt helped you uh, with your mental approach to the game. So since you have a business you're working on, why don't you talk a little bit about that so the listeners can hear what you're doing and, and why you uh, think people undervalue tea. Ah, yes. So uh, the, um, the opportunities that I had um, a few years back, I got, I got, I got hired to coach the uh, Hong Kong national baseball team. And uh, up to that point, my consumption of tea was if I went to the sushi bar, I'd always get some green tea. <laughs> then I found that green tea is actually good for you. So I started to add that to my diet in terms of, you know, because I'm trying to pay attention as, as best I can to, to what you're eating. And, and it's, you know, how it would help you with, with your performance. And so I, I ended up going over to Asia. When I first went there in, in Taiwan, in Taiwan, it's like 100% humidity and 94 degrees. So 
hot tea doesn't necessarily come right to the front, which I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit of a missed opportunity because oolong tea in Taiwan is just outstanding. And what I ended up doing when I played there was I'd go to the 7-Eleven, grab an iced oolong tea off the shelf. I couldn't read, so I just grabbed something and I taste it on the bus. And if I liked it, took a picture with my phone. So the next time I came there, I'm like looking at all the pictures. I'm like, oh, that was good. And then I'd grab that one. But um, how it progressed, though, was I was over coaching with the Hong Kong club and we had tournaments in Japan and Taiwan. And we also would cross the border over to China and play a few, you know, series of games over uh, just o over a few hours drive in China. And um, and so we we played one tournament in Taiwan and coincidentally next door to the hotel was a tea room. So I went in there with one of our, our guys who spoke Mandarin and we just, before we'd go to the field, we'd just sit and drink tea with this woman at her tea shop. And it got to the point, cause we were there for like 10 days. And I think a week or so into it, she would actually pour some tea, hand it to me and then point to all the tea on the shelf and, to, and ask me to take a sip and tell her which one it was. So I got to where I was like, hmm, I'd sip it and be like, I think it's that one, you know? So it, it, you start to figure out the flavors of all these different ones. <laughs> That's yeah. not easy. And then, no, it was, but it was really fun. And so, um, and, and, that's kind of where the seed planted to, to start a business because every day I'd come in there and she'd say, you should sell my tea in the United States. And um, so that was that was sort of the beginning of it as a business. But going back to the whole idea of uh, performance, recovery, focus, all that sort of thing, it really becomes this, this sort of... Um, uh, a, a ritual, if you will, where you you take a moment where you're not doing anything else but being with your tea. You're preparing it, you're adjusting the variables of water temperature, time, amount of leaves, and all that sort of thing. And um, and so it my my really intense uh, foray into tea became actually when I was playing in the Czech Republic because. In Czech Republic, believe it or not, really big, outstanding tea culture there. So I was playing, I was playing in, in a town called Brno, and in the city center, within a 15-minute walk, there was something like six or seven tea rooms that you could go. So one of my favorites, I would go there and they would give you a big, thick three-ring binder with descriptions of all the teas that they served and they had a black tea, white tea, green tea, oolong, pu'er, all these different varieties. So you would, so I would basically go there every day and it would be just this little oasis for me in the center of town. And I would sit and, you know, talk to the guys that work there and keep the menu and just read about it and then just try different ones. And so you end up getting this sort of education on the fly, but um, it, it was really something that, you know, resonated with me, not just for the taste of it, but also that, you know, uh, certain certain chemical compositions in green tea will give you sort of what they call a relaxed focus. So you're not, you know, coffee wired and out of your mind or whatever, but you are not, you know, lethargic or anything. Plus you get, it, it, it helps with, recoveries and all that sort of thing. And then it also is something where you can just get your head straight, where you say, okay, I have this moment where maybe I'm stressed out about the game coming up or how I pitched last time or whatever's going on. There's pl plenty to be stressed about when you're, when you're, uh, you know, on the field and, and whatnot. So if you have this time where you just say, okay, I'm sitting down and, you know, I go, I go through a full like process with it. So I'll take, and, uh, and, and all of the tea that I'm dealing with is all loose tea. And because, and one, one of my slogans that I want, want to put out there too is, is relating to the baseball terminology with tea is, you know, a lot of people consume it in, in tea bags. They just throw some tea bag in boiling water and off they go to do whatever they do. But the slogan I'm using baseball related is just, hey, get off the bag. 
<laughs> yeah, so you hear you hear that when you're leading off second. Hey, come on, get off the back, get off, get a lead. <laughs> and uh, and so I just put it towards, you know, the the T thing of of just sort of giving people another option that's that's quite a bit different actually than just the the little tea dust that you get in in conventional tea bags that have been sitting on the shelf for who knows how long. But if you get some really nice, fresh, loose leaf green tea, it's magic. It's just changes your whole outlook. So and yeah. and your um the site is called insidecornertea.com, correct? Where you're trying to sell yeah, yeah. the tea. Yeah, yeah. I uh I wanted it to be a little nod to my past life as a ball player. So I, I came down with a, a, a sort of, I mean, baseball players would understand inside corner. Yeah, it's part of the plate where you throw a pitch, but also non-baseball people could sort of take that as you're an insider and you can <laughs> take your tea and go sit in the corner and contemplate and have a have your 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 tea time to yourself or with friends or whatever. You're over in the inside corner, you know. So it had it. It hopefully has some multiple meanings. If they don't come right to the front, there's sort of a, a, a underlying message in there. So you were nice, nice wordplay going on, right? Right. To give me a, yeah, a yeah. Couple of samples, which I I, I have sampled. Uh, uh, I think at least three of them, and they're all really good. So uh, I recommend oh, good. Good. To, to everybody uh, that you check it out the uh, the inside corner t dot com, um, and also you know let, let's. Um, Let's also. I have, to, I, I have to give one caveat on that though, because I'm uh, I'm I'm having inventory being shipped around. So when you go to Inside Corner Tea now, you'll find just a, a basic homepage site up there saying we're we're getting everything ready and and we're getting set to launch here. So part of that is is of course our meeting where where I thought. Um, you know, you you do marketing as your as your job, and and then found you as a possibility to help promote the tea business. And then I heard your podcast. I'm like, no, I'll be on the podcast. It, it, mm -hmm. Marketing my tea, nah. But well, I, I think the <laughs> things melded, and I wanted to make sure that we mentioned it because I just thought it was a really interesting way of thinking, like, like performance enhancing, you know, stuff that is actually not going to be tested out by Major League Baseball. So for all those people that are thinking about that, you know, oh yeah, of course, of course. Enhancing and team, I, I appreciate, uh, I, I appreciate the uh, the promo here too. I, I just I. Uh, I'm I'm close to being open for business with sure. it, so I think we might have jumped the gun. But you know, if you're if you hear this and you're interested, then Pat at InsideCornerTea.com is my email, and you can just say, hey, you know, I sure. like I like what I'm hearing. I want to try some, and yeah, we'll we'll get you we'll get you all sorted out. Well, um, this has been great. I think we could probably yeah. spend another hour talking. Uh, because it's really easy the conversations and we didn't cover everything we had to talk about. Yeah, we might have to make, might have to schedule another one of these because we could have just kept going here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm in, man. This is this is a lot of fun for me too. I like I like chatting with you guys and uh, and like I said, I I listened to several of the of the podcasts before coming on and um, and I was especially interested too because we we didn't even bring it up when you guys did the knuckleball episode that uh, my my cousin is Mickey Janice, the knuckleballer. So ah. I think it's, you know, it's sort of a family business thing here where, uh, you know, Mickey uh, fo followed sort of in the footsteps, but went his own way. And, 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 you know, when he, when he throws that knuckleball, it's, it's insane. Like I won't play catch with him. There's no way I'd, I'd have to have like a, a wall and stick my glove out outside of it. Cause I don't know where that thing's going. Nobody he's knows. One, I don't he's think. one of the 32 at the time. I think somebody else is trying, might have even pitched in the majors to make it. That's the thing that shocked us the most about that podcast was only 32 knuckleballers at that time when we did the podcast had pitched in the history of the major leagues. A lot of guys have tried to throw the knuckleball, but to get to the to the major leagues and, and be successful with that, it's uh, it's uh, quite something else. So, well, thank you, Pat. Um, we appreciate you coming on. Um, we'll be posting this soon, and um, we'll have you on another time. Thanks again. Thank you so much. This yeah. was fantastic. Yeah, great talking to you guys, man. Anytime. This is a lot of fun. Appreciate it. Thanks.